Well, I didn't grow up going to church um, on most Sundays, or really on any Sunday. So for me, the Bible was sort of a mystery. I wasn't entirely sure what was in it and based most of what I knew about the Christian faith, to which I wouldn't have called myself a member, on what people told me. And I'll never forget in my eighth grade year when another eighth grade girl walked up to me and she said, did you know that in the end of time, before Jesus comes back, that anyone who's not a Christian will be eaten by a dragon scorpion. <laughs> and I said, that can't possibly be true. And she said, it is, it's in the Bible. I'm reading the book of Revelation at church. And I had no basis with which to contradict her, none at all. I'd never even heard of the book of Revelation. Side note, that's not what it says. But I was, I was terrified. I ran home, got my hands on a Bible, and opened it up right to the middle, because that was my best shot. And I opened right up to the book of Ecclesiastes, which starts out, life is meaningless. And the book of Ecclesiastes <laughs> does, it's true, look it up. And I thought, oh my gosh, like I am in serious trouble. There are dragon scorpions, and life is meaningless. Like, what is happening? Because I never read the Bible. I had no idea what was in there. I had never read it for myself. I think about all of us, and even if you've been in church for a while, even if you've read through the Bible and this and that, even those of us that spend a lot of time in the Word sort of assume we kind of know what's in there. And yet even then, sometimes, we don't. People say things like, God helps those who help themselves. It's not in there. We'll file that under dragon scorpion. <laughs> Sometimes we say things like, this too shall pass. Beautiful sentiment, not in the Bible. So we base what we know of the word on what we hear, what we assume, what we think might be true. So this morning, we're going to do a little bit, we're going to focus on just the New Testament for now, because this is a big book, there's a lot in here. We're going to do a little New Testament 101 to start off our year. So if you have a Bible, grab it. If you have one in your pew, grab that. If you don't want to, that's okay. I can see you, but it's fine. <laughs> I could have our Bible. We're going to look at the New Testament. A little Bible of New Testament 101. New Testament has 27 different books in it. 27 different books in just the New Testament. There's 66 in the whole Bible, 27 in the New Testament. Originally written all in Greek. And that's why when we go to seminary, they have a study Greek. Originally written, not in English, but in Greek. That's why we have a million English translations. Why sometimes you'll be reading your Bible and we're saying one thing and yours says slightly different. It comes from the Greek to the English by groups of people, everyday people like me and you, who know Greek and ancient Greek and know English and translate it. Which is why we have the NIV, the NRSV, the King James, the New Living, the Message, all translations from the Greek, inspired by God, written down by humans. All right, we have 27 books. First four, pretty familiar, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Very good. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are our four Gospels. First three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we call the synoptics. The synoptics, because it's a summary, a synopsis of Jesus' life and his death and his resurrection. Those three really give us the picture of where was he born and what happened, the Christmas story, the Easter story, his healings, his teachings, what this Jesus was about. And then we get to John, and he does some of that too. It's still a gospel. It's still good news. But there's some theology in there. He does it in a different, sort of poetic way that sometimes is beautiful and sometimes confuses us. But he's one of the four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If you flip past the gospels, you'll find yourself in the book of Acts. Now, the book of Acts is where we really, the rubber starts to meet the road. 
Jesus lived, and he died, and he rose, and he was with us, but his person had left. So in the book of Acts, we get to dig in with the earliest Christians as they start to say, how, how, do, we, how do we go from here? How do we go tell other people about Jesus and who he is and what he's done? We see the beginning of the Holy Spirit being given to the people of God. And they're inspired and they go start to preach on the streets. We see the beginnings of the earliest church. As they say, okay, we believe this, but now how do we come together? So that's Acts. Then we move into the letters. Now these are all those names. And a lot of you know this, but these are all those names that you see, Romans, Philippians, Corinthians, Ephesians, Galatians, those are places. Ephesus, Corinth, those are places where Christians, just like you and me, were getting together and saying, okay, so we've heard about this Jesus, and we believe that he was the Son of God. What do we do next? It's when we start to unpack our theology, where we start to ask questions like, what is grace? What does it mean that Jesus died on the cross for me? What does it mean that we're now called disciples? They also start to unpack what does it mean to live together as the church? Because if you get people together, there's going to be some disagreements. They start saying things like, well, I was baptized by that guy, and those people were baptized by that guy. So are we all the same church? So it's the logistics. What does it mean to be the church? Those are the letters, the letters to the churches. And then that takes us, and most of those are written by Paul. That takes us all the way through Revelation. Revelation is also a letter, but it has, that's our dragon scorpion. <laughs> it's not actually in there. There is a dragon. Uh, but <laughs> that takes us through Revelation. Revelation is this apocalyptic letter. It's one that needs a lot of care, and, and we have to put on like theological, exegetical gloves before we read it, because we read it at first, and we're like, what's happening? <laughs> but it, it has this amazing statement that we hold on to, that one day every tear will be dry. One day Jesus will come back and make it all right. So it's full in the middle of its imagery of hope. All right, so that's your New Testament 101. This diverse and fascinating book, composed of 27 other books, Greek to English, letters and stories about Jesus and apocalyptic language, it's all there. It's all there. But it's not just a book, right? That's why we're here. It's not just a book. It's not Harry Potter, and it's not War and Peace. Those are both excellent books. But... It's God's letter to you. The New Testament is God's word to you. When I had, when I first started reading the Bible, so we had dragon scorpions, we had life is meaningless, I gave up for a while. <laughs> and then another girl approached me, another eighth grade girl, and she said, uh, would you like to come to Bible club after school? And I was like, I don't know, that is one crazy book. <laughs> But she said, no, no, come and try it. I promise, come try it. And I went and I started reading the New Testament. I started reading the letters of, to the churches. I read those stories about Jesus, most of them for the very first time. And what I found there was faith. Reading the New Testament changed my life. It changed the words that I used as an 8th grade girl. It changed the relationships that I had. It changed the course of my vocation and my relationships and my attitude. It turned everything upside down because it's not just a book. And the New Testament can do all of those things for us. A lot of you uh, came this morning and you thought, you know, I have some New Year's resolutions. And we all do, right? We're going to work out more. Huh? Raise your hand if that's one of your resolutions. You're going to work out more. Most of us, right? We're going to exercise more. That's a good one. We're going to stress less. 
We're going to focus more on our relationships. We're going to start doing those things we always said we would and travel. And those are all good. I'm not here to tell you that you have to scratch off all those things. Those are all wonderful goals. What I would like to add is one more. One more. Dave and I would like to invite you to do the New Testament challenge with us starting today. It starts today. We'd like to invite you to read the New Testament from start to finish with us starting today. It's a lot. It's two to five chapters a day, depending on the thing. If you look in your bulletin, you have a reading plan. Ta-da! That we've created for you. A reading plan. Some days it's two chapters, some days it's five. Why? Partly because we're not great at math, but partly, truly, because we're preaching about certain things each Sunday. So, for example, this week, if you're doing the New Testament challenge, you're reading the book of John. And on Sunday, Dave will be preaching on what you've read that week. He'll preach on the book of John. So we're all moving through it together. Now, there are a lot of ways that you can do this. There are a lot of ways. Because you may be thinking, you know, I've tried this before. I've made a resolution. I was going to read the Bible this year. And I got part of the way through Leviticus Law or the building of the tabernacle, kind of lost interest, and gave up. Well, that's why this is helpful. It's bite-sized pieces, two to five chapters. Some of you commute to work. What if you got the Bible on audio and listened to it on the way to work every day? Just listen to it while you're driving. Or listen to it while you're on the treadmill. Two resolutions at once. Walk on the treadmill, listen to the Bible. You can listen to it. You can read it with your kids. If your kids have a children's Bible, you can read it in the children's Bible with them. Maybe you say, I'm going to wake up 15 minutes earlier or go to bed 15 minutes later. Because that's really all it is, is this little bit of time. And it's not always going to be easy. It's not called the New Testament wander. It's not the New Testament easy resolution. It's the challenge. But what if you did it? What if you committed today and said, I'm going to try. I'm going to try to read the whole New Testament. We start today with the book of John. We move through John. We'll read Acts and then the letters and through Revelation. And then we go back to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And we did that so you can be reading the stories of Jesus in Lent. And then that last Holy Week, the stories of Jesus' death and resurrection. And it concludes on Easter morning. So it's January, February, March, and you're done. And you'll have read the whole New Testament. Read it for yourself. Not taking what Dave and I say as, as absolute, not just what your friend says on the street. You'll be able to say, I've read it for myself. And we're asking you to do this because we believe it's everything. The Bible is a, not just a book. I can promise you there'll be days when the reading is hard or when your schedule is busy. But as someone who saw these words change my life, I can promise you it'll do the same. The Holy Spirit inspired the New Testament once, but speaks in each of us every time we come to the Word. So we invite you this year to get a Bible, to get out your New Testament, and to read it with us from now through March, and to watch what God does in your life and in your work. Let's pray.